Welcome to the world of faith, one of seven worlds in seven world productions, a subsidiary of Angelgram Music. My name is Gino and I am the sole owner of Angelgram Music and executive director of seven world productions. Continuing our series with In Search of Faith, where we're talking about Christianity at this time, here is part two of several parts. Hope you enjoy. Christianity Part 2 The genealogy and nativity of Jesus is where we're continuing from our previous discussion in the Gospels. Jesus was Jewish, born to Mary, wife of Joseph. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke offer two accounts of his genealogy. Matthew traces Jesus' ancestry to Abraham through David. Luke traces Jesus' ancestry through Adam to God. The lists are identical between Abraham and David, but differ radically from that point. Matthew has 27 generations from David to Joseph, whereas Luke has 42, with almost no overlap between the names on the two lists. Various theories have been put forward to explain why the two genealogies are so different. Matthew and Luke each describe Jesus' birth, especially that Jesus was born to a virgin named Mary in Bethlehem in fulfillment of prophecy. Luke's account emphasizes events before the birth of Jesus and centers on Mary, while Matthew's mostly covers those after the birth of, of Jesus and centers on Joseph. Both accounts state that Jesus was born to Joseph and Mary, his betrothed, in Bethlehem, and both support the doctrine of the virgin birth of Jesus, according to which Jesus was miraculously conceived by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb when she was still a virgin. At the same time, there is evidence, at least in the Luke's version in the Acts of the Apostles that Jesus was thought to have had, like many figures in antiquity, a dual paternity, since there it is stated he descended from the seed or loins of David. By taking him as his own, Joseph will give him the necessary Davidic descent. In Matthew, Joseph is troubled because Mary, his betrothed, is pregnant. But in the first of Joseph's four dreams, an angel assures him not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife because her child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, wise men or magi from the east bring gifts to the young Jesus as the king of the Jews. They find him in a house in Bethlehem. Jesus is now a child and not an infant. Matthew focuses on an event after the Luke nativity where Jesus was an infant. In Matthew, Herod the Great hears of Jesus' birth and, wanting him killed, orders the murders of male infants in Bethlehem under the age of two. But an angel warns Joseph in his second dream and the family flees to Egypt, later to return and settle in Nazareth. In Luke chapter 1 verse 31 through 38, Mary learns from the angel Gabriel that she will conceive and bear a child called Jesus through the action of the Holy Spirit. When Mary is due to give birth, she and Joseph travel from Nazareth to Joseph's ancestral home in Bethlehem to register in the census ordered by Caesar Augustus. While there, Mary gives birth to Jesus, and as they have found no room in the inn, she places the newborn in a manger. An angel announces the birth to a group of shepherds who go to Bethlehem to see Jesus and subsequently spread the news abroad. After the presentation of Jesus at the temple, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus return to Nazareth. Now we'll talk about his early life, his family, and his profession. 
Jesus' childhood home is identified in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew as the town of Nazareth in Galilee, where he lived with his family. Although Joseph appears in descriptions of Jesus' childhood, no mention is made of him thereafter. His other family members, his mother Mary, his brothers James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his unnamed sisters, are mentioned in the Gospels and other sources. The Gospel of Mark reports that Jesus comes into conflict with his neighbors and family. Jesus' mother and brothers come to get him because people are saying that he is crazy. Jesus responds that his followers are his true family. In John, Mary follows Jesus to his crucifixion and he expresses concern over her well-being. Jesus is called a tecton in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, traditionally understood as carpenter, but it could cover makers of objects and various materials, including builders. The Gospels indicate that Jesus could read, paraphrase, and debate scripture, but this does not necessarily mean that he received formal scribal training. When Jesus is presented as a baby in the temple per, per Jewish law, a man named Simeon says to Mary and Joseph that Jesus shall stand as a sign of contradiction while a sword will pierce your own soul. Then the secret thoughts of many will come to light. Several years later, when Jesus goes missing on a visit to Jerusalem, his parents find him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And the people are amazed at his understanding and answers. Mary scolds Jesus for going missing, to which Jesus replies that he must be in his father's house. Now we'll talk about his bap baptism and temptation. The synoptic accounts of Jesus' baptism are all preceded by information about John the Baptist. They show John preaching penance and repentance for the remission of sins and encouraging the giving of alms to the poor as he baptizes people in the area of the Jordan River around Perea and foretells the arrival of someone more powerful than he. Later, Jesus identifies John as the Elijah who was to come, the prophet who was expected to arrive before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Likewise, Luke says that John had the spirit and power of Elijah. In the Gospel of Mark, John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and as he comes out of the water, he sees the Holy Spirit descending to him like a dove, and he hears a voice from heaven declaring him to be God's Son. This is one of two events described in the Gospel, where a voice from heaven calls Jesus Son, the other being the Transfiguration, which we'll talk about later. The Spirit then drives him into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan, Jesus then begins his ministry after John's arrest. Jesus' baptism in the Gospel of Matthew is similar. Here, before Jesus' baptism, John protests, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus instructs him to carry on with the baptism to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew also details the three temptations that Satan offers Jesus in the wilderness. In the Gospel of Luke, the Holy Spirit descends as a dove after everyone has been baptized and Jesus is praying. John implicitly recognizes Jesus from prison after sending his followers to ask about him. Jesus' baptism and temptation serve as preparation for his public ministry. In the Gospel of John, it leaves out Jesus' baptism and temptation. Here, John the Baptist testifies that he saw the Spirit descend on Jesus. John publicly proclaims Jesus as the sacrificial Lamb of God, 
and some of John's followers become disciples of Jesus. In this gospel, John denies that he is Elijah. Before John is imprisoned, Jesus leads his followers to baptize disciples as well, and they baptize more people than John. Now let's talk about Jesus' ministry, his public ministry. In the synoptics, they depict two distinct geographical settings in Jesus' ministry. The first takes place north of Judea in Galilee, where Jesus conducts a successful ministry, and the second shows Jesus rejected and killed when he travels to Jerusalem. Often referred to as rabbi, Jesus preaches his message orally. Notably, Jesus forbids those who recognize him as the Messiah to speak of it, including people he heals and demons he exorcises. John depicts Jesus' ministry as largely taking place in and around Jerusalem rather than in Galilee, and Jesus' divine identity is openly proclaimed and immediately recognized. Scholars divide the ministry of Jesus into several stages. The Galilean ministry begins when Jesus returns to Galilee from the Judean desert after rebuffing the temptation of Satan. Jesus preaches around Galilee and in Matthew chapter 4 verse 18 through 20 his first disciples who will eventually form the core of the early church encounter him and begin to travel with him. This period includes the Sermon on the Mount, one of Jesus' major discourses, as well as the calming of the storm, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on water, and a number of other miracles and parables, and it ends with the confession of Peter and the transfiguration. As Jesus travels towards Jerusalem, in the Perean ministry, he returns to the area where he was baptized, about a third of the way down from the Sea of Galilee along the Jordan River. The final ministry in Jerusalem begins with Jesus' triumphal entry into the city on Palm Sunday. The Synoptic Gospels, during that week, Jesus drives the money changers from the second temple and Judas bargains to betray him. This period culminates in the Last Supper and the Farewell Discourse. Near the beginning of his ministry, Jesus appoints twelve apostles. In Matthew and Mark, despite Jesus only briefly requesting that they join him, Jesus' first four apostles, who were fishermen, are described as immediately consenting and abandoning their nets and boats to do so. In John, Jesus' first two apostles were disciples of John the Baptist. The Baptist sees Jesus and calls him the Lamb of God. The two hear this and follow Jesus. In addition to the twelve apostles, the opening of the passage of the Sermon on the Plain identifies a much larger group of people as disciples. Also in Luke chapter 10 verse 1 through 16, Jesus sends 70 or 72 of his followers in pairs to prepare towns for his prospective visit. They are instructed to accept hospitality, heal the sick, and spread the word that the kingdom of God is coming. In the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are notably obtuse. They fail to understand Jesus' miracles, his parables, or what rising from the dead means. When Jesus is later arrested, they desert him. In the Synoptics, Jesus teaches extensively, often in parables, about the kingdom of God, or in Matthew, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom is described as both eminent and already present in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus promises inclusion in the kingdom for those who accept his message. He talks of the Son of Man, an op apocalyptic figure who will come to gather the chosen. Jesus calls people to repent their sins and to devote themselves completely to God. He tells his followers to adhere to Jewish law 
although he is perceived by some to have broken the law himself, for example, regarding the Sabbath. When asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus replies, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Other ethical teachings of Jesus include loving your enemies, refraining from hatred and lust, turning the other cheek, and forgiving people who have sinned against you. John's Gospel presents the teachings of Jesus not merely as his own preaching, but as divine revelation. John the Baptist, for example, states in John chapter 3, verse 34, He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. In John chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus says, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. He asserts the same thing in John chapter 14, verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Approximately 30 parables form about one-third of Jesus' recorded teachings. The parables appear within longer sermons and at other places in the narrative. They often contain symbolism and usually relate the physical world to the spiritual. Common themes in these tales include the kindness and generosity of God and the perils of transgression. Some of his parables, such as the prodigal son, are relatively simple, while others, such as the growing seed, are sophisticated, profound, and abstruse. When asked about his disciples why he speaks in parables to the people, Jesus replies that the chosen disciples have been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, unlike the rest of their people. For the one who has will be given more, and he will have in abundance, but the one who does not have will be deprived even more going on to say that the majority of their generation have grown dull hearts and thus are unable to understand. In the Gospel accounts, Jesus devotes a large portion of his ministry performing miracles, especially healings. The miracles can be classified into two main categories, healing miracles and nature miracles. The healing miracles include cures for physical ailments, exorcisms, and resurrections of the dead. The nature miracles show Jesus' power over nature and include turning water into wine, walking on water, calming storm, among others. Jesus states that his miracles are from a divine source. When his opponents suddenly accuse him of performing exorcisms by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, Jesus counters that he performs them by the Spirit of God, or finger of God, according to Matthew 12, 28, arguing that all logic suggests that Satan would not let his demons assist the children of God because it would divide Satan's house and bring his kingdom to desolation. Furthermore, he asks his opponents that if he exercises by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? In Matthew 12, 31 to 32, he goes on to say that while all manner of sin, even insults against God or insults against the Son of Man, shall be forgiven, whoever insults goodness shall never be forgiven. They carry the guilt of their sin forever. In John, Jesus' miracles are described as signs performed to prove his mission and divinity. In the synoptics, when asked by some teachers of the law and some Pharisees to give miraculous signs to prove his authority, Jesus refuses, saying that no sign shall come to corrupt an evil people except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Also in the synoptic gospels, the crowds regularly respond to Jesus' miracles with awe and press on him to heal their sick. In John's Gospel, Jesus is presented as unpressured by the crowds, who often respond to his miracles with trust and faith. 
One characteristic shared among all miracles of Jesus in the Gospel accounts is that he performed them freely and never requested or accepted any form of payment. The Gospel episodes that include descriptions of the miracles of Jesus also often include teachings, and the miracles themselves involve an element of teaching. Many of the miracles teach the importance of faith. In the cleansing of ten lepers and the raising of Jairus' daughter, for instance, the beneficiaries are told that their healing was due to their faith. Next time on In Search of Faith with our Christianity part number three, we'll be talking about the proclamation as Christ and the transfiguration and then the Passion Week and the activities around Jerusalem and then the Last Supper and we'll deal with the agony in the garden, betrayal and the rest, the trial with the, with the Herod and Pilate and the priests and then the final crucifixion and entombment and then finally the resurrection and the ascension. Hope you like this episode. If you like this episode, click like and leave comments so that we can discuss this further. Uh, also, if you'd like, uh, please subscribe and that way you'll receive email notifications of future episodes in this world and other worlds. Try out our other worlds, the wonderful world of art, the world of books, the world of food, the world of family, the world of games, and the world of music. Go and be inspired.